Um, sorry if it was a little bit glitchy for a couple of folks. We don't have any more video going forward, so that shouldn't happen again. Um, my name is Lindsay Lunau, and I'm going to be the moderator for the session. I just want to invite Leah to go ahead and start recording. Oh, we're already done. Okay, awesome. So hello, everyone, and welcome to um, Cradle to Grave, a whole system look at waste creation and waste management, both at home and abroad. Um, as I mentioned before, my name is Lindsay Lunau. I'm a, a, the Environmental Outreach Coordinator with Environmental Management at the City of Calgary, and I will be moderating this session, which features two amazing presenters. Uh, we have Stephanie Southgate, an environmental education specialist with Green Calgary, and Michelle Diaz, who's an educator, um, along with me at the City of Calgary. I also would be remiss if I didn't mention that Leah is also here providing her technical support on behalf of ACE. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, so please note that um, throughout the presentation, we are going to be sharing a lot of very useful resources that you can use with your students. Um, so Leah will be posting into the chat a link to the ACE website where you can simply go and enter your name and email address and they'll send you a copy of the combined PowerPoints for today and all of the resources that we talk about. Um, so please make sure to do that before the session is over. Um, also, as I mentioned, I did ask Leah to start the recording and this session is being recorded and will be made available through, through the Alberta uh, Council for Environmental Education's website. So if you miss any part of it or if you want to share it with a colleague, you can do it through that site. So this session today, <coughs> excuse me, is part of the um, two-day symposium being offered um, called Hand in Hand, Working Together Towards a Sustainable Calgary. And the symposium itself represents a collaboration between the Alberta Council for Environmental Education, the City of Calgary, and our environmental education community, which is why you have me as a City Cal of Calgary representative moderating this session. And Marie representing ACE is moderating another session um, that's running concurrently here. So the symposium has consisted of 12 exciting sessions that have covered a range of topics, including uh, the Eco Schools Certification Program, Biodiversity, Waste Management, and Indigenous Perspectives. Recordings of all of these sessions are available on the ACE website. Um, and the neat thing about the sessions is that they feature multiple speakers like our session today, including seasoned environmental educators and City of Calgary experts. And to better meet your teaching needs, we've divided the sessions into the elementary and secondary stream. So this workshop that you're in today is specifically designed for secondary teachers. So don't worry if you're teaching younger students, um, there's still a lot that you can get out of this workshop, but we encourage you to uh, check out the parallel workshop we recorded yesterday titled Waste Not, Want Not. And um, Leah, if you wouldn't mind um, maybe looking up and posting into the chat uh, the link for those resources as well, just in case we have some teachers of a younger uh, students joining us. Um, perfect. So for those of you who have not heard of the Alberta Council for Environmental Education, um, they're a small nonprofit organization whose mission is to advance environmental education in Alberta's K-12 schools. And their vision is that Alberta students are environmentally literate and equipped with the knowledge and skills to create a sustainable future. I would also like to note that they have the best conferences. So uh, now that you know a little bit about us, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you wouldn't mind sharing in the chat, um, if it's not your real name, share your real name. Um, and if you could share which school you're with, and which grade or grades and subjects that uh, you teach. Um, it's just great for us to know who's in the room and to see um, who's interested. Uh, in this very, very exciting topic. Um, so this is our plan for today. Um, I'm just going to start off with a quick introduction and then we'll hear first from Michelle Diaz, my colleague at the City of Calgary, who will give us the local perspective by explaining how waste is handled in our city. Um, that will be followed with Stephanie Southgate from Green Calgary, who's going to provide more of a global perspective and get us really thinking about product life cycles. 
Finally, both Michelle and Stephanie um, will wrap up um, and show us how to empower students through positive framing and action. And then I'll um, just share some extra information with you at the end. I want to be clear that there will be some opportunities for Q&A throughout the presentation. Um, so feel free as questions come up, just post them in the chat and I'll gather them and ask them at those um, designated times. So just before handing it over to Michelle, it's very important that we acknowledge that um, Calgary is located on Treaty 7 territory, which is a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place and traveling route of the Blackfoot nations, including the Siksika, Pakani, and Kainai, as well as the Tutina and Stoney Nakoda First Nations and the Métis region number three. We further acknowledge that the long history of Indigenous peoples is inextricably tied to this land and that unique um, that a unique relationship exists between Indigenous peoples and the natural world. This relationship, which is based above all else on harmony with Mother Earth, has allowed the original inhabitants of these lands to survive and thrive for thousands of years prior to the arrival of the first Europeans. And as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has recognized, reconciliation will never occur unless we are able to reconcile with the earth. So today we honor and acknowledge the knowledge keepers, scientists, artists, youth, and teachers like yourselves who move us forward toward recognition. I mean, sorry, re reconciliation. Um, I also do want to recognize um, another reality that teachers are facing this year with COVID and the many challenges and constraints that teachers like yourselves have to deal with because of it. So we at the City of Calgary and, and ACE and, and our partners are all mindful that you're dealing with a lot at the moment. And we want to express our deepest and most um, heartfelt gratitude for your dedication to keeping our students engaged in learning. Um, you are the true heroes this year, and we are so happy to be here to support you in the important work you do. So um, thank you so much for everyone uh, for joining us. And um, then uh, that's the end of my introduction. And I'll invite Michelle now that I've got her a little bit emotional to share her screen and to go ahead with her presentation. And Michelle, we've got you on mute as well still. Okay, thank you for letting me know that. I'm going to just... Um, I'll get you to just hang on, Lindsay, there until I am completely ready. And it you looks bet. like I'm okay. Is that about it? Um, yeah, it looks like you're showing your whole slide. Do you just want to go forward by one just to make sure we still have that top banner? Good, you're good to go. Okay, thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, thanks for having me here today. My name is Michelle Diaz and I'm from the City of Calgary Waste and Recycling Services. And um, yeah, I'll just be talking today, first of all, about how we are doing here in the City of Calgary regarding uh, our waste and moving the community towards zero. Um, we do have a goal of zero and that is actually by the year 2036. So if you weren't aware of that, I think that's a pretty neat fact um, that we have that goal. And um, by the year 2036, we would like to be landfilling nothing and diverting all of our waste from landfill. So that's a good thing to know. Um, I'd also just like to ask everyone to reflect for a moment on this big upside down triangle or right side up triangle, however you see triangles. Uh, we will be talking a lot about recycling today. Uh, but I think it's really important to remember, and this is something that like a lot of adults tend to forget, like many people believe the three R's are, are all equal and, you know, uh, or sometimes people think the three R's are recycle, recycle and recycle. But in fact, recycling is quite low on the totem pole of what we can do for the environment. And our goal as educators is to move people up that hierarchy. So to start you know, realizing that, you know, we're recycling and composting as second nature now, what we really want to get people to do is move into thinking about reusing more often and reducing waste as much as possible. Um, this slide here is, is to show how Calgary is going about reducing our waste um, and diverting waste from landfill. So you can see that, you know, we've got recycling and composting programs and, and a lot of other programs here, but the big bar along the bottom is the most important one. And that is 
education, communication, and engagement. So getting our residents and our citizens, our students um, engaged and and knowledgeable about how to use the programs and why it's important to use the programs is really the main goal. Uh, some good news is that we are doing quite a good job right now in Calgary. We have actually reduced our waste by half by introducing um, uh, black cart and green cart programs in the city. Uh, and that's really great news. So we are uh, on our way to meeting our goal for sure. Okay, so first of all, what does Calgary do with our waste now? Well, we've got three waste streams and these three waste streams are now um, mandatory bylaws across the board, which is really great news. And that just happened over the past couple of years. So you should have access to uh, garbage, composting and recycling everywhere you go. That means whether you're at home, whether you're at work, at school, at the hospital, at a restaurant, um, it, those streams should be in place uh, wherever you go. And that is a bylaw and that's, that's really also really fantastic news for the city. Now, where does our garbage come from? We contribute to making garbage all um, in, in many areas that we may not automatically consider. So we know we make garbage from our own homes because we're the ones who take it out at home. Um, but we also make garbage when it comes to um, you know, any when we're at work, um, institutions like schools and hospitals, community centers, when we're out and about at the mall, um, hotels, restaurants, and all of that. And anytime there's construction and demolition as well, um, we all do contribute to those things as well, whether malls are getting renovated um, or stores that we we frequent, res uh, restaurants uh, that we like to go to are getting renovated, or even just um, our, our roads infrastructure um, any kind of cement and pavement that's getting put down and taken away and, and all that. So we all contribute to many um, areas of making garbage. Here in Calgary, our waste goes to our three city of Calgary landfills. Now, um, that that's everything that goes into the garbage. It goes straight to the landfill. And uh, here in Calgary, we do have sanitary landfills and sanitary landfills are a safe place to keep our waste. They protect the groundwater. That's the main job of a sanitary landfill is we wanna protect our watershed. Um, and they also make it safe, uh, a safe place to live around as well. So um, that's the job of the sanitary landfill and it does the job well but sanitary landfills are really, really expensive to operate. So we want to be filling them as slowly as possible. And in the end, sort of stop filling them as when we can, uh, when we've completed diverting as much as we possibly can from uh, landfills. So um, something that a lot of people don't consider uh, is that with what happens to the garbage when it's in a landfill. Um, and it actually just sits around forever and ever. And we actually have to do the job of taking care of it for the entire life of that landfill, which adds to the expense of it. Um, I know that when I was little, I asked my mom what happens inside a landfill. And she told me that everything in there is just going back to nature and turning into dirt. And I think we have this idea that even banana peels could be helping couches and everything is coming together as one. Uh, but Absolutely, inside a landfill, it is tightly packed with garbage and dirt, so there's no air in there, and it's kind of like a mummy's tomb. So things stay very nicely preserved. As you can see, these are some newspapers that were packed into a landfill in the 70s. Uh, well, sorry, that, that one from the Herald is from 1974. Uh, it's very common to be able to read newspapers and that are in perfect condition out of old landfills. And this one from 1921 is the oldest newspaper we've ever found in landfill, so that's pretty incredible. Um, some other examples of things from the 70s from a landfill we dug up, these are chicken bones. Um, kids always think that these are human remains. It has to be something very dramatic. Um, here is a jar of mayonnaise. It's dirty, of course, but still looks like a jar of mayonnaise and grass. So this doesn't look too dissimilar from how it probably went into the landfill. And grass can be a huge problem in landfill because um, anything that is organic matter, that just means it comes from a living thing, so food and yard waste, um, is just sitting there and it's actually decomposing very, very slowly anaerobically or without oxygen and producing 
greenhouse gases such as methane and CO2, and we don't want that to be happening. So when grass can make up to 50% of residential waste in the summertime, putting that into a landfill doesn't make sense. So that's why we've got our composting program now. So we are not packing our landfill uh, needlessly, and we're actually using that organic matter to make uh, a useful product, which is compost, which is a fertilizer. Okay, so our goal here is to divert as much as we can from landfill to compost, recycling programs. Um, the City of Calgary has uh, lots of different recycling programs, such as our, our six fire stations that accept household chemicals, um, e-cycling, bottle depot, and also donation. We encourage people to do donate as much as they possibly can, uh, things that they don't need anymore that are still viable, that could be useful to someone else. Of course, we all know about, about Kijiji. Kijiji is just the most fantastic invention um, that that um, is good for, the, for everybody. Uh, and so, uh, this is what we want to do is divert as much waste from landfill as possible. All right, so when we're talking about recyclables, I just want to review the stakeholders along the recycling change. So we are all talking about the same things here, and this will be important once we get into Stephanie's portion, because um, she's going to go into deep, deeper detail here. So in Calgary, we the, the job of us as citizens is to put the right things into the recycling. Uh, our blue carts or, you know, our recycling bins if we live in apartments and townhouses. And then the city takes that away. Sometimes that also is taken away uh, by other haulers as well. Um, it'll go to a sorting facility and the sorting facility sorts it into metal, glass, paper and plastic. And then those products are packaged up and sold to companies that then go about making them into new products that then will go out to the retailers and be sold again to the citizens. So that's how the, the recycling chain works. I'd also like to say a word about where our recycling is going right now. Um, over the past few years, there's been a lot of media um, about what's happening to our recycling and how it's going overseas. And luckily here in Calgary, um, our recycling that comes from our recycling center mainly stays within Canada and largely within uh, North America. So that's really good news. And it's always much easier to um, check the accountability and transparency of all the places we're sending things to when it's within our own country um, and even North America. So this is this is good news for us and we can feel quite um, comfortable and safe that our recycling is going uh, to to get recycled here in Calgary. Um, I want to pass along some resources now. Um, I'm not going to talk today about what goes into composting and recycling. Um, and, and I think it's something that people have lots and lots of questions about. But these are great resources that you can use with your students. Um, you can you can you know, get all the right information here from the green cart pay web page at the City of Calgary um, and also um, what goes into recycling. And then the recycle facts section is actually fascinating. So I really encourage you to take a look at these pages. Um, if you're wondering about your collection days and when they are, because you know, they're kind of all over the place now, I never know what, when my day is. Um, you can actually get um, a, an app or you can actually get phone calls or text messages or sign up for emails that'll tell you what your collection days are, so it's not a mystery to you. Um, you can also call 311 for any issues at all that you're having with your cards or questions about um, your, your recycling or composting systems in, in, a, in a department complex or anything like that, as well as questions about where things go. Uh, we do have a function on our website as well called What Goes Where, and it is where you can type in anything under the sun, like a certain type of light bulb or a car seat or anything you're trying to get rid of. And it will tell you the best way to dispose of that item. Here are some great videos. Um, they're all under six minutes. So um, pretty easy and fast to watch and pretty entertaining. Uh, the recycling center, the composting facility, and as well, we've got one called Good Too Good to Waste. And that's a really short one. It's excellent on why it's important to compost. We do have a waste quiz and you know you can be a, a student or a teacher or anybody to be taking this quiz. 
Uh, and we do have a recycle game as well. And it's not just for kids, it's animated, but it'll stump um, lots of people. So we, we, we encourage uh, people to play this game as well. It's pretty neat. We do have school tours um, and at, we largely focus our school tours towards grade fours because of the waste in a world curriculum element there. But we also take school tours um, typically in a typical year, we would, we would um, be happy to tour uh, groups from um, you know, grades seven up to 12. Um, if there's a group that wants to come to us and have a presentation at our facility and, a, and a, a bus tour. That's during regular times. We've actually now put out something in lieu of our school tours since we can't do them. And it's our food waste reduction lesson plan. It does include a lot of videos and some of the videos on the previous page, as well as some really good ideas. This, this lesson plan is very um, adjustable. You can do it in an hour, you can do it in a week, or you can do it over the course of a, a long period of time and really get deeply into it. So there's lots of options and you can take a look at that. And I think now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And just before I pass it along to Stephanie, um, I think I'll just ask if there are any questions right now. Lindsay, do we have anything coming in? Well, I have a question. So that'll give um, folks joining a chance to also put the questions in. Um, so I saw that the glass is getting recycled in Western Canada. What is the glass being recycled into? Okay, great question. So glass is one of those products that's actually really cheap because glass is made from sand and sand is very plentiful. So it's not like it's expensive to be producing glass um, like it is to be producing metal, for example, or even paper. Um, but one thing they've discovered, um, and glass is usually really contaminated it has lots of there's broken glass and there's lots of tiny little pieces of stuff like pen lids and bread tags and things um, and it's really expensive to clean that however there is something that they have found that's a great use and that is sandblasting so if you use sand to do sandblasting there is a, 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 a dust that comes up called cellulose that's really bad for your lungs and so the people who are doing sandblasting you know suffer from from that problem they they want they can reduce that though if they use recycled glass in sandblasting that the that um get yeah, that what am i trying to say dust is not created at all so it's like this is what you want recycled glass for there's a market for it so that's good we do have um a big glass pile though that you know builds it's just like a pie it's like a mountain and it it gets taken away but it's just it's there at the at the shepherd landfill it's kind of neat to look at. It's one of the things we visit on our bus tour and back in the good old days <laughs> when we did that. Okay, though, that's awesome. I don't see any more questions in the chat, but Michelle, if you wouldn't mind just monitoring it while we switch over to Stephanie's part of the presentation. So Stephanie, I'll invite you to go ahead and yeah, you're off mute and I'll get you to share your screen, please. Oh, thank you. Oh yeah, and that's looking good. All right, yeah, Stephanie, please go ahead. Um, so thank you to Michelle for talking us through the local aspects of recycling and composting. Um, so I'm now going to turn it over to more of a global perspective on waste and sort of thinking about the bigger picture of waste. And um, so we all know that we have to incorporate global citizenship into our classrooms. Um, but I think this is a really important thing for us to focus on. So for our students, environmental concerns have always been a part of their lives. They'll have grown up hearing about climate change and about the climate crisis. It's going to just be a very normal thing for them to hear about. So because of that, I think it's really important for us now to move beyond just teaching us about the facts and teaching them about the facts and teaching them really what they can do about these issues that they care about and supporting our students to take action. So for our students, the environment is likely going to be a part of their job. So whether they go into work directly in the environmental sector or in a different sector, it's going to be an aspect of their job. So for example, if you go to work in an office in a job completely unrelated to the environment, you might have waste reduction targets or emission reduction targets to adhere to in your job. So it's something that they'll have to think about. And I think that's only going to increase. The environment's also becoming an increasingly important voting issue as well. So it's important that they're environmentally literate and understand this issue if that's going to be something they're voting on. 
And finally, I think it's important for us to recognize that our students are the influencer generation too. So I'm sure we could think about lots of negative impacts of social media, but it does also present a lot of opportunities as well. So for our students, if they're taking environmental action in their classroom or at homes, they have access to a really large audience straight away via social media. So they, their voice can really be heard by a lot of people. We also want global citizens to feed into the sustainable development goals too. So the sustainable development goals are a set of goals created by the United Nations in 2015. And these are a set of goals for things we want to achieve by 2030. So there's two goals that are particularly relevant for our session today, which is goal number 12, responsible consumption and production, and goal number 13, which is climate action. So on the Sustainable Development Goals website, uh, there's lots of really interesting facts on there that you could use within your classroom for teaching. So facts that will really bring these sort of goals to life for your class. So I'd really encourage you to go to the United, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals website and just to check out those different goals. Some really interesting information on there. So as Michelle was saying, we sort of really want to change our mindsets away from just recycling and composting and really empowering our students to take action on the issues that they're facing now. So we want to present the information to students, but we want to do this in a very positive way and alongside solutions. So we really want to empower our students to take action. So we're moving from just recycling and composting, which obviously is a great thing to do, but for our students particularly, they'll have grown up with these things being part of their everyday life. It's not new to them. So we really want to move now to moving beyond that and teaching them how to reduce the waste that's actually created. So to do this, I'm gonna walk you through a product life cycle. So I'm gonna go through the diagram once just as a diagram, and then we'll apply it to a product after that. So it's quite often very easy to think about our products in terms of just the use and then post consumer. So how we dispose of them. So this is just sort of thinking about either landfill, recycling or composting. But we really need to start thinking of that in a much bigger picture. So we can also think about the materials that are used to create the product and then the product itself. As well as that, we need to consider the transport between each step. So during production, parts of the product may go through several cycles of production and transportation if the parts are made in different locations. Every step along the way requires inputs, which could include energy, natural resources and water. As well as that, each step will also have outputs, so that might be waste and emissions. And many of these inputs and outputs might have impacts in other countries, so if a product's made in a different country but sold in Canada. We might not actually see a lot of those negative impacts here, but it might be in other countries. If we think about adding recycling into this, we're sort of cycling back to earlier on in the system, but we can see that that actually has a lot of inputs and outputs as well. So as Michelle showed us earlier with that diagram, there's actually a lot of stages to recycling. So it takes a lot of inputs and outputs to, to recycle a product. So now we're going to apply that to a t-shirt. So a product that's actually really quite simple, um, but a very popular item. So we have a billion t-shirts sold annually every single year around the world. So very simple, but very popular product. So if we think about a t-shirt, we need, first of all, the raw materials. So let's just say it's a cotton t-shirt just to keep things quite simple. The cotton's normally going to be grown in the USA or probably more likely Canada, uh, sorry, China or India. So the inputs will be a lot of water. Cotton plants take a lot of water to, to grow. And we'll also have a lot of pesticides as well. So like actually less than 1% of cotton around the world is organic. So most cotton plants are using a lot of pesticides. At this stage, we're going to see some emissions. So the white fluffy cotton balls are actually harvested mostly by machines. So we need to consider the emissions from this equipment. So then we have production. So the cotton balls are going through many stages by machines before they're spun into yarn. 
This yarn is then woven into a rough braid fabric, which is treated with chemicals until soft and white. That's then bleached and dyed. So this cloth will be sent to a factory, usually in Bangladesh, India, China or Turkey, where it's sewn by hand. So if you're a social studies teacher, this is a really interesting stage to actually think about the labour standards and working conditions at this stage, particularly if you're looking at a product which is made in a developing country. So the inputs at this stage will have lots of energy, water and chemicals. So for just one t-shirt, it's estimated that it takes about 2,700 litres of water just for one t-shirt. Outputs at this stage are going to be emissions and contaminated water is a huge problem. And again, this is a problem that we mostly see in other countries, not in the countries where the product is sold. So the next stage is transporting to other countries for sale. So we're looking at high emissions again. So next is the use. And we actually have to consider a lot of inputs and outputs at this stage too. So if you think about the t-shirt that you're wearing, you wash it, you dry it. So we have a lot of water and energy to wash and dry our t-shirts and emissions from those appliances. Once we're done with that t-shirt, we then have to dispose of it somehow. So we again have transport to however we're disposing of the item. So at this stage, it might end up in a landfill and we do actually see a lot of clothing ending up in landfill. Even if you donate this or reuse it into cleaning rags, we're going to just go back to the use and it's still going to be very energy intensive at this stage again, whether somebody else is wearing it or if it's being used for cleaning rags. So hopefully this diagram just illustrates just how much goes into every single product and why it's so important for us to now move beyond recycling and composting and to really rethink the way that we're buying things and consuming different products. So I was thinking about this this morning, actually, when I was just making my morning coffee. So typically I make a pour over a coffee and um, coffee filters. And I was thinking this morning, well, maybe it's not too bad because I put these coffee filters into the compost. So it's not too wasteful. But actually, if I apply it to the product life cycle, a lot of energy and a lot of resources have gone into making this product and transporting it to the store where I bought it from. And all I'm doing is using it once before I put it into the compost. So maybe there's something that I could do. Maybe I could use a cloth filter instead. So I just tip out the coffee grounds and I reuse that same filter over and over and over again, rather than using something that, although it doesn't seem very wasteful, is actually really wasteful for me just to be using once. So I think it's a really great thing for us to work through with our students. So you could use that diagram and encourage them to think about either a t-shirt or their favorite item of clothing or something a lot more complicated. So why not think about a cell phone or a laptop and just how much has to go into those products to make them. So I think it's good for us to encourage our students to rethink consumerism. So we can do that by shopping secondhand, looking for recycled or organic fabrics washing less and air drying, donating or reusing. But the most important thing I think we can do is to really encourage them to buy less. So most of the st statistics that I got for the t-shirt today came from a TEDx video. So I've linked that here. So if you put your email into um, the ACE website, you'll get a copy of these slides and these links. So this kit all came from the life cycle of a t-shirt. So like I said, a t-shirt's actually a very simple product in terms of a life cycle analysis. If you want to get a bit more complex, you could look at the wildly complex anatomy of a sneaker. So this one shows lots of different parts and different materials all coming together just to make one pair of shoes. So again, you could start off quite simple and then really add the complexity with these students. So if you're interested in incorporating sustainability into the curriculum, there's a lot of different ways that you could do this. So if you're a science teacher, you could look at this in climate change um, or using natural resources. In social studies, through global citizenship and governance, 
So this is a really interesting time to think about that as we have a new law banning single use plastics in Canada, which will be enforced later this year. If you're an art teacher, you could think about turning waste into art. If you teach math, you could think about measuring and doing a waste audit with your class. And I think careers lessons are actually going to be a really interesting place to think about sustainability as well now. Okay, so now I'll hand it back over to Michelle. So she's going to talk a bit about positive framing with our students. Thanks, Steph. Um, so just, you know, taking off on what Steph was just talking about, um, I'm going to talk about the waste hierarchy once again and use an example because I think um, we're starting to get into some real ways that we can um, actually do and take action. So I'm going to give the example of a Ziploc bag and take you up the waste hierarchy. So if um, this was on a scale of one to 10, one would be uh, one being the uh, something, something you can do for the environment and 10 being the best thing you can do for the, for the environment. Uh, I'll, I'll use a Ziploc bag. So what if I use a Ziploc bag one time and then I throw it in the garbage? Let's call that a one out of 10 because I didn't litter it. At least I put it in the garbage. Let's take it up the scale to a three. So it is a stretchy piece of plastic. So you could recycle it with your plastic bags. That'd be a three out of 10. Taking it up to a seven out of 10, I could reuse that bag two times, 20 times by you know, washing it out and drying it and using it again. Calgary is really dry. So it's quite easy to dry Ziploc bags. Or I could take it to a 10 and actually reduce the Ziploc bag. That means I don't buy Ziploc bags and I use other things for um, carrying around my food. So for example, um, jam jars or yogurt containers, other wonderful little containers that we get along the way that all kinds of our products come in. You don't have to buy a Tupperware these days at all. <clears throat> it's very easy to find all kinds of containers that are extremely useful. Uh, I stopped buying Ziploc bags about seven years ago, and I have not looked back. Um, although I kind of loved the Ziploc bags at the time, like really, I thought, oh, they're so nice and clean when you take them out, and they're just so good looking. But I'm telling you, I still have beautiful Ziploc bags in my drawer from uh, frozen products that I get, like blueberries and spinach and stuff like that, that I use again. And those are really hardy Ziploc bags. So I'll use those over and over until I don't want to anymore. And then I can throw them away. Um, or Ziploc bags that people give me that I rinse out, wash out and use again as well. So I have no lack of those, but I also use all kinds of other containers to keep my things in and, and it works just fine. So you can use that scale one to 10 and sort of take yourself you know, all the way up to how could you actually reduce that? Um, so those might, that might give you some ideas about how to use that with your students. Oh, thank you, Steph. Steph's moving the PowerPoint along for me here. Um, eco guilt is a big factor uh, for, for all of us these days. And we definitely all feel the pain of knowing that we could do more and not knowing exactly how much to do. And that can be actually so you'd think that it might have the effect that guilt often has, which which it might be um, kind of helpful in some way. But eco guilt actually does have the opposite effect in most cases where it can actually be overwhelming and just paralyze you. So instead of being motivated to take action, you just get really, you know, despairing and and get into the, the mindset of thinking maybe, maybe you know, I, I there's nothing. How can I change this? What can I do? Um, you may have heard of the idea of not having any tragedies before grade four. So just kind of keeping it as positive as you can um, until, you know, after that point and, and then start getting into some of the deeper issues. Something we often overlook is talking about our feelings around these issues. Eco guilt is a real thing. People have real feelings when we talk about endangered species um, and, you know, species becoming extinct or, you know, the polar bears you know, starting to lose their habitat and things like this, people get really emotional. And sometimes we don't give those things air, airtime that can really be helpful. And then, of course, taking action is the ultimate way to empower students to feel good and feel part of the solution. 
Um, so anything you can do to celebrate the small things that you've done along the, along the way and accentuate the positive sides uh, is really going to be helpful in assaging the eco guilt that we all have and making us feel better. And then we'll just be empowered to take more action in the end. Um, the other thing I want to suggest to everyone, there's a fantastic uh, document called the Positive Communication Toolkit. When I read this, I was like, everyone needs to read this who communicates to others because it talks about how our beliefs can be limiting um, and how our pre preconceived notions actually really affect how we frame things. And when we can frame things positively, um, it, it can actually be a game changer. So what we want to encourage is the beliefs that change is possible. The problem is solvable. Um, our actions are, you know, they may seem small, but they are part of the bigger solution. We can recover from this. And every small thing we do is actually meaningful. So if we think of those things, that is going to give us just like, you know, a, a positive feedback loop where we're going to want to do more and feel better about doing more. Uh, and that's where change will actually happen. And then the things to avoid um, are things like, um, it's, you know, this is too big, it's too late. If you're not doing everything to be environmental friendly, env environmentally friendly, then then nothing you're doing is ma it matters, you know. Um, and you don't need to make big sacrifices, even, you know, doing the little things you can do are important. And then it is actually really important not to feel like an outsider in this. We want everyone to feel like they are part of the conservation effort. Like we are all doing little things. All the little things are coming together to be part of this. And um, just to conclude, you know, this is not always going to be easy. And sometimes it's not going to just automatically feel good. Like, you know, we recycle uh, and a lot of people are really hooked on, you know, and really keen on recycling because it does make you feel really good when you, oh, you recycled. And so you've done good for the environment and your eco guilt is lessened and that that's, that's a weight lifted and that's good. Um, but you know, that's low on the totem pole and we are trying to move people up and actually get into some of those more uncomfortable areas. So having those conversations is really, really important. Talking about feelings, um, and, you know, getting into the, the challenges. So Steph did talk a lot about some really wonderful ideas earlier um, about how you can um, get, you know, get into some of these other areas and get outside your comfort zone. Thanks, Steph. <laughs> Um, so whatever we can do to challenge ourselves and challenge our students to get into those other little areas like up that scale where we're like oh I don't know how to reduce I don't know but can I live with those Ziploc bags you know um and you know there are all, are all kinds of ideas that you know you we're gonna have a ban on these single-use plastics soon so maybe you know taking your spoon in your pocket everywhere you go is going to be a thing now um there's something called the sharing solution which for kids like are, the kids are supposed to be sharing all the time we're constantly telling kids to share and then adults forget to share and they're like i need my own drill i need my own you know power tools and my own this when actually blending and borrowing is huge so um there's all kinds of sharing solutions uh trading toys trading books um trading games around between friends clothing swaps. And of course, uh, Steph also talked about buy nothing. And I actually um, personally did have a buy nothing year uh, back in 2005, I think, before I had children. So it was, it was easier to do back then, granted, but it absolutely changed my perspective on my consumer habits because I was not a shopper beforehand. But I realized that, yeah, I, I abs you know, it is a freeing to the mind when you're not thinking about buying things and sort of um, how often are we thinking about consuming and buying things? And it's sort of an automatic uh, a lot of the times where, uh, and it might be just, we're doing it to make ourselves feel better. Sometimes we don't like need these things. Do you really need these things? So, um, you know, buy nothing can be a day. It can be a week. It can be a diary of what you bought instead of not buying the thing, but what did you buy? Um, so lots of ideas. And if anybody um, wants to just put into the chat and share uh, with each other, like ideas that you've had around this or um, 
ideas that that have been useful or anything that's popping into your mind, please feel free. And I think I'll pass it back to Steph now to go over a few more resources. Is that right, Steph? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Yeah, so just before we finish today, I just wanted to share a few different resources with you. Um, so Green Calgary is offering virtual workshops at the moment. So we'll drop off um, sanitized materials at the school and collect them after the workshops. And um, just to make sure the virtual workshops are still as hands-on as possible for students. And um, so these focus on waste, water, energy, and citizen science. And um, so you can find a lot more information about them on our website. And something um, relevant for our workshop today will be our Earth Day event in 2021. So uh, on April 22nd, we are hosting a free workshop. This is for grades three to nine. Um, it's sort of mostly, I guess, relevant for those age groups, but other age groups could join too. And so we're really focusing on waste reduction and how we can make a big difference by rethinking recycling and rethinking composting. So like I said, it's a free workshop, um, our registrations just directly on our Green Kids homepage. And something else that we offer for schools are waste audits. So we can come into the school twice to do um, an initial waste audit, help you to create an action plan, and then we'll come in and do a follow-up waste audit just to see how successful um, that action plan has been. And so I guess in normal times, this is something we could do and get lots of kids in the school involved um, would really be like rummaging through all of that garbage. Um, at the moment, we're offering a sort of adapted version of this. Um, so rather than collecting all of the garbage and sorting through that, um, we're just providing some laminated copies of uh, just photos of garbage so that students can sort that and I guess develop the skills of doing a waste audit. Um, but without having to sort through all the garbage, we know that wouldn't be a great thing <laughs> to be doing right now. Um, we have based all of the pictures that we're using on previous waste audits. So the data that they gathered together is still based on real schools and should be fairly representative of their school. And um, so again, all the information about that is on our website. And something else that might be interesting for you, if you're thinking about doing an environmental action project within your school, is that there are a lot of grants out there um, to help you with these projects. So I know a lot of these projects will cost money and maybe that's money you just don't have within your school budget. Um, but on the ACE website, um, there's a list of all of these environmental grants that you can apply for. So I would really encourage you to check out the website or you could contact us if you need help finding them as well. So there's a lot of definitely support and financial support out there as well, if this is something you're thinking of doing. So thank you so much for joining our presentation today. So I think we'll move over to some questions now, Lindsay. Well, that's awesome. So I have invited people to put some questions into the chat. Um, I don't see any at the moment, but I just wanted to share that Stephanie, like in a previous role, I did an exercise similar to what um, you did actually in a boardroom with people in a corporate environment. And we deconstructed a painting in the room and then tried to figure out what all the components were of the painting and, and um, walked it through that life cycle. And it was even fascinating for adults. They really liked the activity. So it's a fantastic suggestion. Thank you so much. Um, I do have a question for you, Stephanie, though. Um, so you said there are going to be some workshops available on Earth Day. And will you also be attending the 100% Virtual Mayor's Environment Expo from June 1st to 3rd and presenting workshops there as well? <laughs> Yes, yeah, we will. So we'll have a range of workshops available and um, focusing on the same areas as our school programs. So waste, water, energy, and we'll be hosting different workshops at the Mayor's Expo as well. Wonderful. And then Michelle, will you as well be attending the Mayor's Expo and offering some virtual presentations? Yes, we are actually offering a presentation about waste reduction, and it kind of is going to go really deeply into our limiting beliefs that we have and how we can actually get past those to take meaningful action. So it's kind of like, you know, the conclusion here ex expanded, and that is for secondary. Excellent. And I 
mentioned that we're going to have a very expanded secondary program for grades 7 to 12 as part of this year's expo. We've got some great questions coming in, Michelle. Um, the city can only recycle certain types of plastics right now, so I think we're doing one through six. Um, does the city do any advocacy work to encourage producers to move um, packaging to types of plastics that can be recycled? Maybe you want to talk about extended producer responsibility, Michelle? <laughs> Um, yeah, so so um, basically when you're looking at plastics, you want, there's two types of plastics you can recycle. It's all mainly containers and packaging. So uh, we certainly don't take, you know, when people are thinking of plastic, like this is plastic. We don't take products, we take packaging. Sorry, this is just a little sheet from my, <laughs> you know, toothbrushes, toy trucks, that kind of plastic we don't take. What we take in recycling is packaging. So containers, plastic containers, yes. They should have a symbol on the bottom with a one to seven in them. Um, some of them don't, but they are one of those types anyways. If it's a container and it's a hard piece of plastic, then that's what we generally want in the program. So we do take types one to seven and those just say what, what type of plastic it is. Um, but absolutely the city is involved in what we call EPR or extended producer responsibility. And that is a program that this year, Alberta is, I believe, going to be uh, legislating. So it's already something happening in BC and Ontario. Um, I think it's coming uh, out kind of across the province, uh, sorry, across the, the country right now. It's similar to Alberta, we're adopting it. Uh, hopefully this year. And what it means is we're putting the responsibility for um, the packaging back onto the producers and manufacturers of the product. So we're getting them to think about what their pack, how they're packaging their stuff and making them responsible for paying for the recycling of it. So if you do that automatically, this recycling is going to be less and better. Um, the packaging, sorry, is going to be less and better. And so um yeah we have somebody at the city who's one of his main project is actually epr and what's happening with it and how calgary is sort of interacting with that it's a really really fascinating and you might think that it makes things more expensive for us it doesn't at all it just kind of wraps into the bottom dollar um and and it doesn't change the pricing for consumers uh, like very much at all like it's not noticeable on the consumer end so that's a, a great question and it's really interesting that Wong seems to be very gung-ho about EPR um, because of his work with AUMA. Um, I also just posted into the chat, Michelle, a link to the Recycling Council of Alberta's page on extended producer responsibility in case anyone sure. wants to learn more. Yeah. Um, I have another question in here. Um, so we've got, um, are we doing any work around circular economy? Okay, so uh, circular economy. Yeah, well, I know that the, that absolutely it is a theme that's coming up more and more. Um, and I think that's that the direction that we're trying to move toward for sure. So um, in terms of like on the ground, what's actually happening right now, um, I think there's just mainly a lot of building of the circular economy idea into strategy and policy right now. So that's really where the city administration is looking towards for the future. And I think that's where all municipalities are looking right now. So, and I, I see uh, compostable shells and cutlery, are they actually compostable? Great question. In green cart, we don't take any compostable plastic items. So if it says it's a compostable um, plastic cup, plastic looking cup, um, we don't take that. We don't take cutlery in the green cart. However, if uh, you are at work, for example, and your work says, yes, we do take plastic looking compostable cutlery and, and um, plastic wear, compostable wear, uh, then that is likely just fine because it's probably going to a facility that does handle that. So our composting facility with the city does not handle compostable plastic wear. So not in green card, but other programs quite possibly, yes. Okay, awesome. And just back to the circular economy, I was just checking out a couple of different resources. Um, Calgary Economic Development has some resources on circular economy, Recycling Council of Alberta as well. Um, and I think our task force for economic recovery in the city is also dealing a little bit with circular economy stuff. So I think there'll be more on that 
in the future. Um, we've got a question about our plastics, Michelle. How much of our plastics is actually being recycled? I've heard it's about only 10% of all plastics. Um, that that it de depends on what like stats are really interesting because it depends on what you mean by that. So of all the plastic that we are producing right now, that means all the products we're making that are made of plastic, which is a whole bunch of stuff. Absolutely. What we are sort in Calgary recycling is only packaging. So we don't take the products themselves, which that's a lot of plastic that's not getting recycled. So um, that could definitely be true if that's what what, what that stat is about. Um, but I haven't heard that exact stat. It would be just interesting to see how they're referring to that exactly. So does it mean the plastic that we get at our facility, only 10% of it is actually recycled? The one like what goes into the blue cart? Um, I, I'm not sure, but that's what I can say about that, that stat. Um, just the last one before I move over to my wrap up presentation, but we'll take more questions at the end. Um, I've heard that some cities hosting are hosting events where people can dispose of non garbage items in their alleys like coaches and such. How does Calgary deal with items like this um, and try to keep them out of landfill? Okay, so I think like um, I know in Montreal, it's very common. Uh, they do have bulky items days. So um, that's generally what that idea is called bulk, bulky items. So you put your bulky items out one day and then the garbage truck, the big compactor will come by and take it all away. However, before that happens, it's a free for all. Everybody is out on the streets trying to pick up some <laughs> new stuff. My brother lives in Montreal. He gets so much great free furniture in my back alley too. I have like at least three or four, maybe five pieces of furniture in my house that have come from my back alleys where people just put a free sign on the back. I've put free signs on the back of stuff and it's gone. So um, it's, you know, yeah, in Calgary, that isn't likely going to happen. Um, but what we do is we really push donation in Kijiji. So we want like that sector to sort of take care of that. Um, and we want people to donate and use Kijiji as much as possible. The other thing is that um, usually in normal times, we've got our community cleanups running. And so um, they'll be happening in your community or an adjacent community. And you can take things, not as far as the landfill, you can just take them to the next community over and um, dispose of things that way if you don't want to actually go all the way to the landfill to take it away. So hopefully that answers the question. And Thanks I'll, so I'll much. leap in. Uh, just that in some communities in Calgary have a very lively buy nothing Facebook group communities uh, where you can, yeah, things in working order, you can uh, pass directly to people in your neighborhood. That's so great. Okay, I've got about two minutes before our session is supposed to wrap up slides to finish. Off. So we'll we'll stick around after if there's further questions. Um, but I just want to point out that um, ACE has done an amazing job to help teachers make curriculum connections to environment and sustainability. Um, so right on their website, they've identified very specific curriculum links um, for units of science and social studies. Right now, they're done grades K to nine, and they're working on high school, and they're looking at four sustainability themes. So in each one, they break it down by nature and place, um, links to Indigenous perspectives, and links to climate change. This one is so big that actually on the second page are the links to City of Calgary environment, um, environmental plans and strategies or climate action plans and strategies. So this is just an example of what the grade nine science uh, curriculum uh, link might look like. So when you go to the website, it'll basically look like this. And if you teach great social studies, you'd click on that and they've done a great job with all the links for you. And like I said, grades uh, 10 to 12 are coming soon. Uh, Leah's gonna post a link in of that into the chat. Um, we also wanted to bring your attention to EcoSchools. I mentioned, mentioned it earlier in the chat. It is now a program that is available to all Calgary schools, supported by ACE and partnered with the city of Calgary here. Um, so. EcoSchools is an environmental certification program that has a library of 40 eco actions that um, support learning and action as around waste creation or waste management, as you can see here on the slides, um, but also lots of other areas. And each of these eco actions come, <clears throat> excuse me, with their own guide, which makes it really easy for teachers to get started. And schools can either just be participants or they can complete their actions and work towards different certification levels like bronze, silver, gold, or platinum. 
Um, and ACE has worked with our local environmental education community to identify resources to support all of those 40 actions. So I really encourage you to become an eco school. We just started in September. We've got 22 eco schools already. And the neat thing about it is, you know, when Michelle was talking about eco guilt, like it's so great for the kids to be able to be working towards collective action and then to see the cumulative results of the whole city and then to see that they're taking part in like a national program and eco schools is even international. So it makes them feel like they're part of the solution and part of something bigger. Um, and then we would be remiss if we didn't thank ACES funders who generously support their work to help teachers infuse more environmental education into their everyday teaching. And with that, I hope that you've enjoyed our session. Sorry for wrapping up so quickly there. I just went over by a minute. Um, if you'd like to follow up with any of us, we've provided our emails here. Um, and then again, if you'd like to receive a copy of the presentation and all the resources that we talked about, please follow that link in the chat that Leah is going to post. We just need your name and email address and then they'll fire it off to you or it'll be accessible. I'm not sure how it works on the ACE website, but it'll be there for you. Um, there are some optional questions as part of that, which would just give us some feedback about what you thought of the session, how we might be able to improve future workshops or topics that you'd like to see. So once again, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to ask Leah to stop the recording. Um, and that way, if there's any questions from folks where you'd like to come on camera, you're welcome to do that.